the Department of Housing and Urban Development in the United States, affordable housing is defined as housing that can be obtained for 30% or less of a household's income. Unfortunately, this is still quite a stretch with inflation on the increase and the cost of living as well. There is definitely a need for affordable housing, not only in the Middle East, but across the world. Let's find out from our industry experts if we are doing enough in developing affordable housing. Ladies and gentlemen, your moderator for the first panel leads the real estate and construction practice of PwC in the Middle East and also serves as the Global Deals real estate leader. He has over 25 years of experience in operational and advisory roles and has worked in several countries around the world. Please help me, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage partner and Global Deals real estate leader at PwC, Dr. Martin Berlin. success through record-breaking sales. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the stage the director and partner of Danube Properties, Mr. Atif Rahman. <laughs> Our next expert is an Oxford and Harvard graduate who made his mark by breaking new ground for the company. His company is currently building Skyline, the world's largest residential building in Atamiya. Please help me welcome to the stage the CEO of Mermar Al Murshidi, Hassan Murshidi. Our next expert, ladies and gentlemen, oversees the professional services and consultancy business lines in the MENA region and has been with his team for more than 13 years. Help me welcome to the stage the head of professional services and consultancy at Civil's Middle East, Richard Hall. Our final expert for this panel has over 20 years of experience in growing and scaling high-performing sales teams for building sales structures, process management, and the implementation of new business generation and account retention strategies. Please help me welcome to the stage the Director of Properties at Dubizzle, Matthew Gregory. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could just kindly adjust your mics to make sure you get the best possible volume. And the stage is all yours. We have 30 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, without any like, like big introduction, I would like to go straight into the matter and ask uh, my panelists, um, are we actually doing enough in terms of uh, building affordable housing in the region? We heard it's a global problem. It's a global issue. And there are several definitions from 30% to 40% of the household income. Are we doing enough in the region? And please keep your answers short. Should Just I? go in okay. order. Okay. Salaam alaikum, everyone. A very good evening. And uh, see, I think, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, it being a global issue, I think it's a global opportunity, Martin. You know, uh, affordable housing segment for me is the backbone of the real estate industry. Uh, there is always room for improvement. I think uh, at Dubai, we are uh, definitely moving in the right direction to deliver affordable housing projects. We cannot compare. There is no comparison that can be made. We cannot compare with London or New York or Mumbai and Paris because we need to take into account the per capita income of the population, which varies. Taxation, which is uh, definitely a factor, whether there is any form of subsidy the government can provide or not. There is no income tax, so there is no subsidy that can be uh, ex executed in the affordable housing segment. I think opportunities when you look at in affordable housing segment, it will always be there because if today I can buy at $100,000, tomorrow I want to buy it at $80,000. So that benchmark will always keep changing. Now what we're doing in affordable housing segment, I think it's, as I said, moving in the right direction. Opportunities, I think, uh, lies in the fact that we can transform uh, how we design the land, 
how we create the density inside a master community. That's a huge opportunity. How we are going to create bank finance facility because, you know, when we talk about affordable housing segment, it really conflicts if we are not empowering the consumer to acquire the real estate, it conflicts with the affordable housing segment because that caters to those people who do not have enough funds. And hence, I think biggest opportunity in UAE is the bank finance that can uh, be a game changer for the affordable housing segment. After that, I think uh, we can keep talking about more and more areas where we can improve and make it more affordable and bring it down from 100,000 to 80,000 and then 70,000 dollars. Look at the per capita income of uh, uh, Dubai, it's about 40,000 or thereabouts uh, per annum dollars. And if you do a calculation of 30 to 40,000 uh, spend going towards your, 30 to 40 percent going towards your housing, I think we are at the right benchmark. And I think uh, you can't get uh, more affordable real estate with the quality and of infrastructure that is being provided. I think Dubai is number one without any doubts if you compare throughout the world in terms of affordable housing projects. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk um, on behalf of our company and within the Egyptian market, which I see there's a huge deficit um, in affordable housing. You know, in Egypt, we're 100 million. In Cairo alone, we're about 15 to 16 million people with a, uh, with a growth rate of around 1% to 2% per year. There's a deficit of 600,000 units per year. So um, we had two, actually, projects that we launched for affordable housing. Our company was one of the uh, biggest investors in affordable housing. And we, it was the first time um, to enter that market, and we didn't know what to expect. So uh, a funny story, all call center can only receive around 3,000 uh, calls per day. When we launched uh, Digla Gardens, it was around 900, it was 9,000 apartments. We received 9,000 calls that day. Our call center actually fell, like uh, it wasn't operational. And that gave us like the indication that, okay, there's something here. Um, but when uh, affordable housing comes also with the image, just because it's affordable, it means it's cheap or it's not well maintained or the design aspect of it wouldn't look that good. And this is something that we really, really try and work on, is that how can you make affordable housing, one, a good investment opportunity for the people who are buying it? Two, how can you make it sustainable? And three, how can you add design and aesthetics to it? And I think there's lots of space that we can uh, grow and develop um, in affordable housing. It, you know, you're talking to the mass here, so you'll always find demand for it. Richard? Well, I, I don't want to preempt your, your, your maybe a follow-up question in terms of maybe what affordable housing is, but I think first and foremost to answer are we doing enough, yes or no, you do need to define it. Um, and I think for every, every country, every city uh, around the world, the, uh, the affordable housing issue is slightly different. And, and, and everybody has a slightly different um, target and focus uh, and how to rectify their affordability issues. Um, if, we, if we focus on Dubai, uh, ultimately, what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to achieve communities that are sustainable, uh, communities that are happy, and communities that are integrated. Um, if we define uh, affordable housing as that, then perhaps we need to do a bit more. Um, to think about all the citizens and the residents of of this city, and how we can integrate them into all all of uh, all the areas and all the communities that we that we are living in and that we are building. So, um, we can we can go into it further in terms of the definition and uh, and what we're trying to target here. But if we look at it just purely on integrated. Uh, sustainable and happy communities. Um, I think we're doing a huge amount, and I think we're in, we're 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 probably ahead of the game in a lot of countries in the world. But um, our our targets and the challenges that we have are very different, maybe to to other countries in the world. So um, yes, we're doing some, but we can do more. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> to echo what Richard just said there, I think there is a definition that we need to understand first. I think that there is a, <clears throat> as we've said, you know, 30% of salary um, to be able to afford housing has already been echoed. I think the, the opportunity that we have in front of us is about trying to make sure that we look at the ever-changing population, certainly if we're focusing here on the UAE, 
um, the type of people that are actually coming into the country, therefore the type of people that are able to afford 30% of their salary going out on housing. Um, you know, we had a presentation there for the, the, uh, you know, the Expo 2020 site. And again, you know, looking at that, some of the names there, high-end premium brands that are getting involved in that, you know, we then look at affordability and you, you've got to question yourself whether or not Siemens and others coming into what is a, an area um, that looks very premium, you know, how are we going to attract people that are coming into the UAE to, um, to actually put down roots in order to want to buy and I think that that's something that you know, we, we need to really align ourselves on, everyone in the room, in order to make sure that actually you know, we are defining the population segment that we're looking at affordability for um, in order to then make sure that the types of projects that people are building, the developments, the types of units, the quality, a big part of affordability, um, all come into play when we're actually shaping um, what could be an affordable policy. But um, you know, to answer your original question, are we doing enough? I think that we're doing some. Clearly, there is more to be done. But I think as we move forward, you know, there are certain um, policies, certain procedures, certain conversations that need to be had in order to make sure that we define it properly to know what we're measuring ourselves against with regards to affordability. So when I, when I just summarize what I just heard is I didn't hear, but yes, we do enough. I didn't hear a no, we don't do enough, but I heard a lot of there's space of an opportunity to create an environment for affordable housing, um, not only in, in Dubai or the UAE, but in the entire region. Um, however, when, when we look into affordable housing, it very often had the stigma, and, and Hassan, you, you, you elaborated a little, little bit to it, of quality and affordable housing. Does it go along well? Is it, is it a conflict? Um, so how can, how can the industry kind of market affordable housing better than it's current doing to remove the stigma? Hassan. Well, I think it comes down to marketing and PR and design and aesthetics. So how do you market that project? How do you market affordable housing, making it as an opportunity for the person buying? So when we started doing our ads, we wanted to change the way that you think about investment. So we had um, uh, pretty much uh, a marketing campaign that says, instead of putting your money, at the time, the apartment was worth 100,000 Egyptian pounds. And that's the same price of a car. And that's usually what the youth want to do right away, is buy a car. They graduate, they want to buy a car, they tell their parents, we want to buy a car. So we wanted to change that mindset of, instead of putting your money in the car, no, come put your money in the apartment. Instead of buying um, an iPad or an iPhone, uh, go put that as a down payment because the down payment was around 10,000 Egyptian pounds. And instead of going on the cafes and smoking shisha all the time, you know, go and pay your installment, which was around um, 600 um, Egyptian pounds. So one is you have to educate the youth into changing their mindset to invest. And the second is the design element and the aesthetics. So you have to add lots of facilities. You have to add um, universities, schools, um, landscaping, and you have to get other designers that can come and talk about the, uh, the project. And tell them that now you're switching your lifestyle from living in very condensed neighborhoods, because usually that's the background of, of, of the clients that come uh, to, to these type of projects, is that they want to change their life. They want to enhance the way they live. Uh, so you get designers and architects that talk about how is this um, project or this environment going to change the way you raise your kids and have a family. And I think once you start hitting these different notations, then the mindset will change and therefore uh, you can change the stigma of affordable housing. So <clears throat> quality of design, who is developing it, how is it communicated to the marketplace, a big role in it. Yeah. But also the backbone in terms of affordability, like financial affordability, and, and Atif, you, you elaborated on uh, to that in your uh, starting statement, is the financial industry environment that needs to be created to support affordable housing, yeah. to, make it, to make it accessible to the market. How do you think that needs to change? How does the, 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 the industry needs to change in that regard? 
Yeah, I, 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 just want, I just wanted to make a point about how we establish that quality as well on the previous question, you know. I don't think uh, we can establish anything other than the delivery of the project. That is the key. That is the report card for any developer. How you deliver, what you deliver, when you deliver. And that, I think, is the benchmark of how we can reinforce the, the belief of the consumer in the affordable housing segment. Going to your, your uh, next question about uh, making it accessible, you know, uh, it's very simple. When you look at the affordable housing segment, we are targeting that mid-income segment who does not have that cash reserve to be able to put down large down payment, does not have that monthly income from where they can take out a share and put into the monthly installment. And that's where we had seen the opportunity when I started the company. We created the 1% per month payment plan. It was runaway success, and till date it is, where we have been able to reach out to the end users, the real consumer of the real estate. Now, when you talk about the accessibility part, there are two things we have to, we have to cater to. One is the price of the property, and how do you acquire, how do you pay for that property? When you look at the price of the property, it is linked to the cost of the property. The cost of the property includes your land, the construction, and then leads into your, uh, 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 sorry, the, the connections, and then into your profits. Land, the cost is what it is. I think the area where we can make a difference is how we can create low density communities where it is less costly to construct those buildings and be able to bring down the cost of the property. In design, we, we not just design, but also on the structure and also, also on the MEP side, we do extensive value engineering. We understand how we can deliver more space in less square feet. You know, we understand how we can create stronger building by utilizing less concrete and less steel. We understand how we can create more appealing architecture by utilizing more sustainable and cost-effective materials. So we do a lot of extensive value engineering on that side. And then uh, age-old uh, method of economies of scale. We, we try and create modular design and, and maintain that economies of scale so our acquisition cost is less and hence the price of the property is less. So that takes care of uh, the price of the property, the cost of the property. I think we have great opportunity on the land side. If we create low density communities, it will bring down the cost. It will help bring down the cost. Second is financing. I, I think I've been, I've been uh, vocal about it for last more than a couple of years. I think we need to make changes to the central bank cap on 50% funding, uh, sorry, 50% down payment before the funding can be done for any off-plan project. That is conflicting with uh, the, the accessibility or acquisition possibility of affordable housing. That is where we have a great opportunity. We make it, we, we, we liberalize that, and we will see a great participation from the real customer, the end users coming into the affordable housing segment because UAE still has a huge population who has been living here for 10, 15, 20 years. They don't know their home country as good as they know UAE. They would want to call UAE their permanent home, but they still don't have a home that they own in UAE. And that's a huge opportunity for the real estate sector. So, so cost, of, cost of building and, and the, the, the way how you build it could be a, could be a great factor in, in managing the cost side of it. Indeed. Um, and through the cost side, also the price yeah. side. Uh, Matt, you're in the market with, on the price side every day with, with Dubizel. Um, do you see a trend there where through these new innovations on the construction side, it's already arriving up on the price side as well? I think that, you know, as you... Let me put it into context, certainly as we look at affordability. I think that what we have on Dubizel is we have a lot of... Um, we have a big audience. Right. Part of that audience we are able to then utilize in order to give us an opportunity to see what trends are coming out into the market. We run a survey a little while ago about you know, uh, what people are looking for within property. 23% of those surveyed want to have a look at new, new projects, off plan. Right. What we're really talking about today, affordability, because at the moment, if we look at affordability outside of new projects, off plan, you know, that's not that affordable because of the down payment. The 25% means that a lot of people within the market are unable to get on the property ladder with a, um, with a secondary property. So they have to look at off-plan. Which pretty much resonates with what Atif just That's said right. in terms of the, 
the downhead payment. That's right. So, so what we then find is that as we drill down into that data, what we then see is that 52% of those um, that want to have a look at off-plan property actually want to use it to live in. Right. It's not an investment. So the market's changing. You know, as people actually now want to, um, the, to want to actually set down roots, as you said, they, they've been here for a long time, they want to get on the property ladder, um, there's no way they can do that depending on a secondary side, so actually what it means is they're guided towards that of off-plan. And a number of the developers that we've worked with at Divisal, are, it's all about the offer. It's all about the payment plan, how much and how, or, or over how long people then have to pay. And that then gives the ability for things to become affordable. And you know, there are a number of instances where we work with developers, and we did one in Abu Dhabi recently, um, where actually the payment plan itself was over the best part of 18 years. Wow. So I'm sitting nodding to Richard to my right, because we work with Savills on that. Um, however, the opportunity that it gave is for people to actually um, you know, feel that they can own something. And I think ownership is a big thing, right? As the population changes, people do want to own. The transient nature of, uh, of the UAE becomes less apparent as people actually want to settle down and to, to actually live here. And that's one of the things, again, you, you, you referenced to Bizzle, that's one of the things we see in the types of projects that are coming on board now. We have over 350 projects on our new project section. What it enables us to do is to really get a clear view of the types of projects. Right? And a lot of it is coming out at that affordable level, that sub 400, 500,000 dirhams for a, for a studio one bed, where actually people can now see that there is an opportunity to own. But again, it's really down to the developers to drive the type of offer, uh, the payment plans, the how people actually are getting on that. Danube, again, is a, is a pioneer of really affordability. Um, and so, you know, that's something that we're certainly seeing. Secondary, difficult. Uh, primary, you know, very accessible. Yeah. I think I think we have to be quite imaginative in how we look at this. I don't think we just do you need to say, oh well, it's the developer's uh, responsibility to try and uh, to look at this. I think it's a there's a there's a huge amount of people that are involved in 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 finding something that works. Um, clearly, the banks and, and on the finance side will help. Clearly, there's government policy that will also. Um, will come in there and create some sort of mechanism that can um, a allow a, a large, what is probably a dormant market out there uh, to access into this market, um, as well as the developers. So, you know, you, you, you have to be imaginative. You, we can't just say, well, land prices is, is land price, and so we have to go, you know, we've got to think about who, who in our communities that we deal with on a day-to-day, -day, whether it's driving our children to school and uh, the bus drivers that pick our kids up in the morning and, and the school teachers and the, and the nurses in the hospitals, it's the key workers that create our communities. And we need to think, you know, how do we integrate their living standards into our own and, and, and make so their daily commute to work is not two hours, it's, it's 10 minutes because they're part of that community. And therefore you have to be quite imaginative in how that works. And so that, that's sort of the public-private sector relationships where you are getting the finance. You know, but as you say right at the beginning, there's a huge opportunity there. You know, you've, you've got a population of Dubai at the moment which is, what, 3.2, 3.3 million people. 90% of those are, are expatriate, and a huge, huge chunk of those are earning you know, family income of maybe 10 to 15,000 dirhams. They are unable to stump up the deposits, as we've, as we've spoken about, to access into that market. Well, guess what? In Dubai, we're facing an oversupplied market, but we might have the answer on our doorstep in terms of a huge dormant market that can access um, uh, th this supply, and as long as we can create some sort of mechanism for, to do so, um, we, we may challenge. We, we have a, a real, a real fight, fighting chance of dealing with that supply challenge. Um, and that, that you know, look around the world, there are policies that have been implemented. Um, some are successful, some are successful for a while, um, but th they're all part of a market, a moving market dynamic, so they have to change, and we're no different. So what policy or mechanism we implement now, we need to monitor and we see how it reflects. You know, the example in the UK when you had a help to buy uh, policy, which was fine for a couple of years, but all that did was gave you know, a big chunk of the sort of middle income uh, population and demographic ability to buy property or to, to put down a deposit. All that ultimately did was rise prices. So, and then it, 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 it didn't help long term. 
So we need to be imaginative. We need to think about all the parties involved, whether it is government, whether it is uh, developers, the banks, um, as well as the consultants and, and brokers in the room, and, and, and think of something that is a bit more, um, you know, everybody's in. I, you know, I don't like to use the word subsidies necessarily, but I don't think it has to be that. I think there are more imaginative ways of doing it. Um, but, you know, there are people who, who haven't got those deposits, but perhaps they're sitting on five years plus of uh, gratuity. Now, we could think of a policy where you could use that gratuity as a down payment for a property, but at the moment it's locked up. You know, there's, there's different ways of looking at it. You know, land, land purchase. You know, you could argue that if you were selling, um, if you were buying land, 90% uh, of that land was sold at a market rent, uh, market rate, but 10% is on a 50% um, uh, uh, of cost uh, compared to market, and therefore that is going to be aligned for affordable housing. So there's lots of different ways that you can think of it, um, but we just have to be imaginative, I think. So, so that, that brings us to the players that are, that are in that field of affordable housing, because it set, sits a little bit at the, at the intersection of the government and the private sector. And we, we elaborated a lot on what the, the, the private sector role is in there, the developer role, banks. Um, um, you elaborated a little bit in terms of regulation to the government sector as well. Um, what other roles can the government play to enable the sector to incentivize the private sector to play and to build? Because there's no doubt like Egypt, 600,000 units. Vision 2030 in Saudi stipulates 400,000 units uh, by 2030. Um, that means 40,000, which is the entire annual supply in Dubai, each and every year over the next 10 years. So how can the government give, or the governments, give that a push? I mean, see, you know, uh, when you look at uh, the government's participation, one is on the land, the design, the DCR, the development control regulation that can have huge impact on the cost of the property. Then after that, you know, it is uh, largely linked to the, the taxation if there's any benefit that can be given to material being imported for affordable housing projects or the connection fees that would go to the utility service providers for affordable housing projects, how we can make it, because it's very simple. Let's, let's say, for example, if uh, the connection fee was a million dirham uh, less costly, uh, we would be able to generate more consumers, and that means there would be more revenue. So say it's, it's very simple. Affordable housing segment is the backbone of the economy. The more the number of people who can own the real estate, retain their income, they don't need to send their income back to their home countries, retain the income over here. That, that would impact every industry, retail, automobile, insurance, banking. It will have impact everywhere. So it's, all, it's about how we can create more and more incentives. Sky is the limit. Uh, we can keep uh, discussing about uh, the, the, the opportunities in every segment. But right now, what I see, the two largest opportunities, at least in UAE, if we, if we can make changes to the DCR, and, and create low-density populations, low-density communities, and the banking sector can have huge impact. Say my Deva connection fee is three million, even if it comes down by 50%, uh, 1.5 million. Distribute that, how much impact is it going to have on, an, on, a, on a community of say 300 or 400 million dirham? It's not phenomenal. But if we do that on the, the, the banking side and the DCR side, I think it has far, far more high value impact that can be created. And then it is in the hands of the developers and their expertise how we can generate more cost effective, more efficient developments, uh, less costly, and hence more affordable to buy. Hassan, so what's your experience with, with Egypt um, on that? And the government involvement. Yeah, well, it's our project started with the government. It was a government program, basically. And the government had rules and regulations. So one, he had to be, the, fam the, the person who was buying had to be Egyptian. Second, he had to, be, he had to, age for, he had to have the age from 80, 18 to, I think, 45, 50. And then um, he cannot have owned a previous apartment before. So therefore, you're limiting the amount of people that can just buy. And these are first home buyers that whoever is buying because you want to solve the housing problem. You don't want investors to go just buy up and uh, apartments and then just wait for the value to go up. So you, one, you have to put these rules and regulations. Now, and you have to secure that the developer himself is not gonna keep the land and wait for the land to increase in price. So the only way they can give you, so say for example, the land is 500 acres. 
they would only give you phase one if you complete, they would give you phase two if you complete 30% of building phase one. And then they send inspections, and then um, if everything's uh, right, then they will give you the permits for the second phase, third phase, and fourth, fourth phase. So there, it has to be a partnership between the government and the private sectors. Now, of course, on the private side, you have to make profits in order for you, um, you know, to continue and sustain these, uh, these mega projects. So therefore, you're going to have to make money on the mass. You're like, this is not going to be a short-term, um, quick win solution. You're going to have to wait till people start, till the project picks up. You finish phase one, phase two, and then people start moving in. It has a good reputation, and then most of the clients are going to come in because you're solving a housing problem. So I think it has to be a partnership with both the government and the private sector, but the main issue is that the land has to be subsidized. The price of the land has to go down. Um, but on the mean, in the meantime, you can, you know, you don't have to, with these kind of environment uh, com uh, projects in Egypt, they don't have to be in the main city. You can go just on the outskirts a little bit. And then you're creating a whole new city. So, and then the value of the land next to uh, your project is also going to increase as well. The government as well. So the government is going to benefit from the whole area if you just put an affordable housing project in that area. So. Yeah, I, I think you have to incentivize all parties. Um, if you're incentivizing the developer, you can do that in many ways, as, as, as we've alluded to. You can give them uh, breaks on, on purchase of land. You can give them tax rebates on construction imports, on steel and, and other materials that you're bringing in, that helps. Um, and connection uh, charges and, and, and all the, all the uh, additional costs that a, a, a contractor would need to contend with when, when building a property. So if those things are, uh, are looked at, that helps. Um, in terms of the, the banks, um, you know, if, if, we can, if we can look at LTVs maybe for first-time buyers um, within a certain wealth bracket, um, that and that all of a sudden, as we've talked about, there's a dormant market there. So uh, we can offer them a lower access into that property. They only maybe need 10, 15% at perhaps lower rates. But the banks do well because it suddenly um, creates a new market there that they didn't have before. Um, and then, you know, again, the investor themselves, they feel like they can access that market. You're giving them um, a low entry point. Um, and maybe you were looking at reducing... Um, uh, purchase costs, whether that's uh, in terms of um, land department fees or something like that. So there's, there's lots of different incentives that you can bring, but all parties who's part of that need to be incentivized. They all need to feel like they've, they've won something there. Um, and if they all feel like there's, there's, there's a positive gain, um, they're more inclined to, to do something that's worthwhile for everybody, I think. And is, is that creation of an all-win environment a task that the government has to fulfill? I, I, as I said, it, you, can't, you can't put the responsibility on, on just one party. I think everybody has to be involved. Everybody's got to buy into it. Um, you know, clearly, you know, government policy is, is a good first step, but it's also how they then engage with the private sector to discuss uh, policies and mechanisms that um, you know, have been seen in different parts around the world and, and almost handpick the elements that, uh, and the policies that work for, for this market. Um, and as I said before, those policies and mechanisms change wildly um, as, as we progress, but we start somewhere. But uh, no, I don't think it, it should fall f uh, f uh, completely on the government. I think there's, all parties need to be involved in that decision because it will give you a better outcome at the end of the day. We are almost at the end of our time slot, but I would like to give the audience the opportunity to engage with um, the panel. And if there's any question, uh, please write. There's a question over there at the back end. If someone can get that person the mic. Sorry to interrupt. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, just want to let you know, if you open your web browsers and type in slido.com, you can interact with the panel and actually ask them questions. Either that or download the application Slido. Sorry about that. No problem. Please, if you, if you can uh, please yeah, mention best, your name uh, and, and company. Probably a half a dozen ways to game your affordable housing scheme. But I'll just give you one um, from uh, my experience in China where the government provided the, the incentives, uh, they uh, would land and, and all of this, and 
the, uh, the owners were lower income. And what the investors would do, they did several things. One, they would wait for the first time buyer to buy and then go to all those first time buyers, offer them more money than they uh, had previously seen um, and uh, pay, pay them off. And those people would then go back, to, the Chinese would go back to their rural communities with this wad of cash and then they would then flip the properties a year or two later so that, so that the prices end up going up anyway. Um, uh, or they would help fund uh, in various ways the, the down payments and the, the payments on behalf of the, of the, uh, the individual uh, affordable housing uh, owner uh, with side agreements and then they would end up owning the properties again and then those people would move into housing that was not exactly the housing that the government hoped they would move into, and then the prices went up again. So uh, definitely as you're thinking about these things, there's the theory and then there's the, you know, really sort of think hard, what would an investor do to, in order to try to, uh, to, to game the system? And so uh, there are quite a few ways still that, that would, for which that would occur. I gather, gather there was more comment than a question, yeah. because I didn't hear a question, to be honest. Have you considered the way that the investor community would game the affordable housing system? Because other places around the world, particularly in the emerging markets, it happens quite a bit. Right, so it was the investor side. No. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, if you come up with a policy, you've got to be very um, aware of how it can be manipulated, perhaps, later on down the line. Um, and, and we've got to be careful. You, you can't just have an open-ended policy that you know can be get can be manipulated, and as you said, um, you offer a first first uh, buyer market an opportunity to buy, and all of a sudden, then somebody else comes along and, and influences that. There are going to be very very strict regulations yes. and um, and policies in place that that negate that. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I, I guess. What, you know, in, in my mind, I was sort of thinking, well, bizarrely, when you, when you, when you look at uh, investment grade um, sort of opportunities, if you are able to have an affordable rented um, asset and you, uh, you, in it are people that are, um, that are feeling like they're inputting to a partial ownership of that property, they're less likely to go anywhere else. So all of a sudden, the, the sort of the net returns of that, or the, the yield, is a lot lower. There's a lot <coughs> lower risk there. So it can, there's an opportunity, um, but and that's something I just thought of. But yeah, generally, I think you're right. You know, you've got to be very careful about uh, how these these um, whatever policies that we implement aren't manipulated, aren't taken advantage for, and end up actually hurting um, the communities that they were devised to help in the first place. Uh, having said that, I think, you know, in fear of it, any, any reform being abused or misused, I don't think we should ever stop from changing because that is the only thing constant. And uh, we need to be smart enough, we need to be strong enough to be able to create regulatory framework that will curtail. It will never be a case that it, can, it will 100% not be misused. This is for sure guaranteed. You can look through the most developed economies and you would find that uh, there has always been a misuse of any provision that has been put in place. And that fear should not stop us from changing. I think we need to make our systems, our regulatory systems, strong enough and, and proactive enough to be able to control such misuse and ensure that the real end users, real people, are definitely benefiting from the affordable housing segment and get, get, giving it back to the economy in different forms by having their own asset, their own home in the country. I think that that's a very good closing statement. I, I, uh, I think we need to go on to the next panel to not blow the entire agenda. Uh, so Atif, Hassan, Richard, Matt, thank you very much for the discussion. And if anyone from the, um, from the audience has further questions, I know that there are a lot of questions there. Oh if, if, we, if, we go, if we go through those, I think, <laughs> oh, wow. Super. It's a retirement. Oh, yeah. It's a big opportunity, that, that is. That's a huge opportunity. It's a big opportunity, trust me. In UAE, with the 
so many people, a huge volume of people who have stayed here 25, 30, some of them 50 years, they don't want to go back. In fact, one of our recent campaign is uh, directed towards that. Own your home in Dubai even after your retirement. Right, so, so we're going to be around yeah. for further questions um, after the panel and we with that. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Warren. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you a warm much. round of applause for our panelists. Thanks again, Dr. Warren.